Welcome to the show, everyone. We have another great guest today, a legend, really, producer and engineer Steve Thompson. His resume is insane. He's worked with everyone from Guns N' Roses, Metallica Prince, Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Madonna, Korn, Soundgarden, the list goes on and on and on. So uh, one thing I didn't ask him about, and if you're wondering about this, the Metallica album, and Justice for All, I didn't ask him because the story's already been told a million times. For those that don't know it, it's all Lars, Lars's fault, the drummer. He wanted the drums high and the guitars high and the bass low for some reason. I don't know why. So don't blame blame Steve for that one. Otherwise, he's got some great stories to tell, and I'll let him get to it. Here we go. Welcome, producer and mixer and songwriter, too. What else? You do all sorts of things. Steve Thompson, you're a legend. Thank you for being on my show. It's my pleasure, Chuck. Yeah. So uh, are you working on anything special right now? I'm working on a ton of things right now. I'm writing my book. It's called Appetite for Production. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And uh, I'm writing. I did two movies I'm writing. And uh, I have about four artists that uh, we're probably going to be doing real soon. Okay. Yeah. So tell me about the movies, because I think I only heard about one. You said Souls. You said this thing is going to be huge. But there's another one. Yeah, the Souls is a movie I wrote with a friend of mine, Ken Kushner. We started writing it, believe it or not in 1997 and um i was doing a lot of work with david geffen so i I told him to send the treatment over to steven spielberg and uh steven responds says you know we like the idea but it's not ready right now which i agree with but with movies it's all about timing which was actually a good thing because i wound up re re uh writing it updating it and uh it's so much better now. Yeah, that is interesting because I had a screenwriter on, the guy that wrote The Dirt and uh, Airheads and some other movies, and he said, like, yeah, he'll sell, he sells these scripts and they and Hollywood buys them, but then they don't make, like, they only make, like, 20% of the movies he, he they, they buy from him, which is really interesting. Well, first of all, um, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Showtime or, or HBO wanted to buy and do a miniseries on it, and I refused it. And I'm in a position to tell them to all go fuck off because if I do the movie, I'm going to be literally involved. I mean, um, who was the director that did the new Star Trek movies? Abrams? Abrams? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Abrams from uh, the guy that did Lost. J.J. Abrams did Lost J. J. and all Abrams. that. Yeah. I think he was, you know, I originally wrote it with Spielberg in mind. But, you know, if I'm doing it today, J.J. J. Abrams would be perfect guy to do this movie. Hmm. He's probably one of the only few that I'd probably be hands off on. Could you think you could get him? Yeah. That's awesome. So we got to tell your story then. How do you, cause you started as just, you started as a DJ in the clubs. You went from DJ in the clubs doing disco and stuff to amazing producer and now writing movies. Like, I mean, you got to tell the story how, how you did this. Like, this is amazing. Well, first of all, I was a guitar player before. That's true. DJ, That's right. Yeah. And I kind of sucked. <laughs> but I, I i i did give it my all and i i, I played drums percussion little keyboards and everything like that was it a band and called civil world is that what it was called civil world yeah nice it was like a glam band back in the day this what you know what we're, we're talking early 70s i mean my major influence was david bowie yeah and uh um, who you'd later get to work with which was amazing yeah i mean it was like um it was a combination of Bowie and T-Rex type of vibe. And, you know, I kind of missed that boat, but, you know, it, it is what it is. And then um, I was hanging out at a lot of clubs in Long Island back in the day. And, you know, with bands like Twisted Sister and everything like that play, but was interesting, you know, um, there's this club called Leone's in, in Deer Park. And they have all these bands and what happened when when the band goes off, the club would die. Everybody go to the bar room, but there was no energy there. So one day I says, I told the owner, I said, why don't you get a DJ in there? And the only reason I knew about DJs is I used to go to gay clubs a lot, even though I'm not gay. But um, right, because you said back then that's the only places that had DJs. It's not right. like today where everyone has a DJ. DJs was rare. Right. And I saw the concept of a DJ. I says, why don't you put a DJ in the club? So when the band comes off, the energy doesn't get lost. It's a revolutionary idea at the time. Yeah. 
So I got a call from the club owner probably about a month or two later. Says, okay, Steve, we put in a DJ booth. You want to be our DJ? Now, I've never been a DJ before. had no clue, but I did have a good record collection. So I agreed to do it. So it was like learning on the spot. And that's how I became a DJ. But the interesting thing is my background in music was all over the place. You know, in the late 60s, early 70s, I was listening to Sabbath, Zeppelin, King Crimson. Bowie was just coming out. James Brown, uh, Marvin Gaye, Al I mean, the whole gamut. I loved it all. So when you DJ, you can't play Sabbath, though, right? Do you have to play more dance music at that point? Well, at, at that era, it was. Mm. But in uh, the early to mid-80s, I was able to work in this club called Speaks, where I could play rock. I mean, at ACDC, uh, was, I played Hell's Bells at 12 midnight. Um, so I could play rock, dance, everything, reggae, hip-hop. It was cool. I liked the, the whole mixture of genre I could play. And we get about 2,000 people a night. Okay, so as you're, you're doing this DJ thing, is if someone approaches you and asks you to work on this uh, dance record, Disco Hustle, and <laughs> right? Well, it was kind of interesting. I was working at this club called Barry Moore's, probably around 76, 77. And the guy who owned the club is Ron Radom. And um, it was a cool club, but he really loved what I did. In fact, at the end of the night, I would always tape my shows and we'd sit down and listen to him, and he was such a big fan. We lost touch, and he got a job with TK Records not sooner after that, and he recommended me to the guy who owned TK Records, is Henry Stone. And uh, so that's how I got involved in dance music. Before that, you know, I would go, when I was a DJ, you would go to record companies, get records and learn, and know all the promoters and the people that were in the industry. So they all kind of knew me, so that helped in the long run. And when I did this uh, album, Disco Hustle, I think it was 76 or 77, there was a, a guy who worked for Anime Roulette, which is a Morris Levy company, uh, asked me if we would compile this dance album together. You know, put all the greatest disco songs of that era together nonstop, you know, sequence everything. And we wound up doing that and uh, they sold it on TV. I was actually in the commercial, dancing. <laughs> Man of many talents here. Yeah. And it wound up selling 12 million copies. I wound up getting a $250 check and no credit on the album, which kind of pissed me off. I did that with, um, I don't know if it was, I think it was Phil Silman, my, a fellow DJ I worked with at the time we put it together. So that was my introduction to that. And then... Henry Stone wanted to hear our talent. So when I was working this club called Uncle Sam's, I was working this other DJ, Mike Arado. I said, well, why don't we pick one of their songs and kind of remix it in the club? You know, we take two records and extend it, phase it, and do all this. It's like a mashup, right? They have those today, but uh, back yeah, then that was, mash, yeah. It was basically a mashup back in the day. And we sent to Henry and he loved it. So we wound up doing remixes for the label, which again, never really been the studio. So I was green as can be, but at the end of the day, I knew what I wanted. So I was very fortunate to work with the right engineers, learn the craft. And that's how that started. So it sounds like it started by you. You had a love of music. You knew you wanted to be involved in music. And then you started doing this DJ thing. And then that the people noticed that. And then from that, it kind of like it was a springboard but also I think part of it was maybe being in the right location, right? Because if you're being a DJ in, I don't know, Portland or North Dakota, you're probably not going to get the people noticing you as, as much back then. Well, I was kind of lucky, you know, being brought up in New York and most of the major labels were in New York. So you, you, mm -hmm. um, I learned the contacts and knew the contacts and basically was in their face all the time. And then what happened as a DJ uh, uh, if you know they had Billboard magazine, and if you were a DJ and a reporter for Billboard magazine, that even gave you more exposure, mm. which I was. You know where they, you know, you would send feedback to the songs they would send you, and they mm. would they would print that. So once I started to get success in remixing on dance music, things took off. Mm -hmm. And then you got management 
Because you did a lot of dance records in the late 70s, and then the early 80s, you got new management and started doing more R&B artists. Well, I, I, I hooked up with Mark Bevan and Andy Kipnis at Advanced Alternative Media, which to me is the best management company in the world to this day. And um, Mark was the first one that approached me. And we started doing R&B music, but I said, I want to do, I, 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 you know, when I started doing music, I never wanted to be typecast of doing one form of music. Mm-hmm. I like it all. Yeah. So we started to do bands like Talk Talk, Psychedelic Furs, uh, uh, Missing Persons, Bowie, Ultravox, Icicle Works. I mean, you name it. Did that whole genre of music and everything was going great. Then at that point, I started to do more pop R&B artists like Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, Madonna, and everything was going number one. I got bored. <clears throat> so I told my manager, I need to do some rock projects or I'm going to go nuts. Mm-hmm. The first major project I did as far as production was in 84 with a band called Bluey Psalm. Now, it was a, a, an international hit. It was a song called Imagination where the singer was very reminiscent of Bowie. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, I have allergies. That's why I'm coughing. So um, I, I said, well, if he sounds like Bowie, why don't I get Bowie's band? So I was able to get a hold of Carlos Alomar, Bernard Edwards, Tony Thompson, Dave LeBolt, Robin Clark, basically the Sims brothers and everybody performing Bowie. We put this record together for EMI at the time. And the managers who managed Bully Sam were the same managers that managed Duran Duran. Mm. So that's how I got to work with Duran Duran oh. in the future. So that was in 84. And uh, everything was going great. And so I finally said, I need some rock projects or I'm going to go nuts. So the first two projects I, I got offered were a band called City Kid, which is now Tesla. Tesla, yeah. <clears throat> and Guns N' Roses. Amazing. Yeah. So, but going back to those, uh, some of those, uh, the R and B artists you work, you work with Prince and David Bowie and, uh, Mick Jagger, uh, the, the 1985, the dancing in the streets, that cover by Mick Jagger and David Bowie. I, I was curious because you were just the, you were not, you didn't actually produce it. You mixed it, but you thought well, that not, not, ex- not exactly. Yeah. Um, Cause you brought in a new guitar player, right? Basically, uh, I got a call. I was just about ready to go on vacation. I don't know if it was Bowie's management that called me or somebody. He says, well, we did this song for Live Aid and want to know if you could mix it for us. And I said, sure, of course. And it was Jagger Bowie. And I heard the tracks and I felt the guitars were kind of lacking. <clears throat> so I wound up bringing in Earl Slick, who was one of my favorite go-to guitar players back in the day. He's a great player. He played with Bowie, Lennon, you name it. He played mm-hmm. with everybody. In fact, if he had his way, he would have been in the Stones instead of Ronnie Wood, but that never worked out. And I did percussion, so we wound up adding additional production and mixing the song, and that's how Dancing in the Streets happened. But the song originally was recorded and video in one night in England. You know, it's just a really quick thing to do. Yeah, right. So that's why you kind of had to redo some of the recording. Well, I didn't have to, but I felt, I said, hey, I wanted to give it that little extra something, something, you know. But is that overstepping your bounds as the mixer, like uh, kind of going against the other producer's tastes? I or? didn't think so. Okay. I mean, I, I told They let you I do was, it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so explain <laughs> that. You had a good uh, analogy for these, the difference between producing and mixing. So like a producer's role is you're working on arrangements, key, and tempo of songs, and you describe the mixer as kind of everything's already been recorded and it's, and it's kind of more like a salad. Like you're just mixing up the ingredients. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you like better producing or mixing or does it, you just love it all? I love writing, producing, mixing, arranging. I love it all. You yeah. know, uh, I never want to get typecast and I never want to be bored. So that's why it's been great to be able to do everything. I mean, I was very fortunate to work with my ex-partner, Mike Barbiero, who was probably one of the best engineers ever. He came from the school of Bob Clearmountain and Michael Brower and Harvey Goldstein and that whole crew. And uh, what I loved about Michael is that, Michael, I wanted somebody who could be able to adapt to all forms of music. 
and make, and that was very important to me. And Michael was able to do that. I mean, damn, we went from Johnny Mathis to Metallica. I mean, how cool was that? Yeah. So you talk about what his, uh, who helped him in his school or whatever, but were you mentored by, uh, Clive Davis and David Geffen? How much did a role did they play in your, um, and kind of mentoring you or. Well, I, I think it was more, uh, Clive because, um, you know, working with Whitney Houston, we won a Grammy for, da- uh, 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 um, the dancing song. I want to dance with somebody. And I worked with Aretha Franklin, expose, even Aretha Franklin did a song with Keith Richards, uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash. And Clive took me under his wings. When I looked about Clive, is he really taught me the essence of a great pop song. That I knew what a great song was, but he, you know, working with him, I got a better understanding. When I looked about Clive, and again, Clive was not for everybody. If he had an artist... It was Clive's job to pick the right songwriters to work with that artist and the right songs. Now, not too many artists will go with that because they want to write their own songs, do their own thing. But Clive had this hands-on approach to doing it that way. And, you know, he hired the best songwriters at the time was Diane Warren, uh, Desmond Child. I mean, he got the best songwriters to write great songs for the artists he worked with. And we hung out a lot together and I learned so much from him. Whereas David... <coughs> David Geffen was a different animal. We did Guns N' Roses, and I remember we had the platinum party at Ed Rosenblatt's house, who was the president of Geffen at the time, in L.A. And I'm in David's office, and he sat down and he says, Steve, you know what? You know, Guns N' Roses is not my thing. You know, He's more into like Laura Nero, Cher, the whole light side. But he says, you know what? I hire people to find bands like this and artists like that. I have what I loved about David, he gave people job security. And what I really loved about him, he let people do what they do, which is very rare nowadays. Hmm. Everybody's like micromanaged. Yeah, that's true. And what was interesting, and he would take me around to the offices and he'd point to this person, this person, he'd point to that person. So see that guy? <clears throat> I go, yeah. He hasn't done anything for, for me for a couple of years, but I really believe him. He's going to find something for me. Wow, that is some faith there. And that person was Gary Gersh, who signed Nirvana not too long after that. We were just talking about him in my last episode. Yeah, he signed Nirvana and uh, Everclear and uh, Sonic Youth and a bunch of, yeah, that's amazing. Well, it's funny when Gary uh, uh, was president of Capitol in the early 90s, I wanted to pick an alternative band. And we, we did, I did Butthole Surfers for him because, you know, when you have all the success in the 80s, when the 90s, when grunge and alternative came in, they look at a guy like Steve Thompson and what the fuck does he know about that? Mm-hmm. And which I think is the biggest mistake in the world to ever think that way. And so that's when I did Soundgarden. I said, okay, you want to feel that way? I did Butthole Surfers. I wound up co-writing the hit song Pepper. And that album, uh, I produced the album. The album won number one alternatives of the year. <clears throat> so I was a big fuck you for anybody who said that, you know, they wanted to typecast me, just like in '98 when I uh, produced Corn. Yeah, they would, never, they would never look at Steve Thompson. What the fuck would he do with Corn? And I wound up making the biggest record. And I spent over a month writing with them in a uh, pre-production studio in Compton, L.A. And I remember when we worked with them. I said, okay, guys, how do you normally write songs? And they go, oh, Fieldy plays the bass line. I said, okay, how else do you write songs? Oh, Fieldy plays the bass line. I said, okay, that's it. <clears throat> Jonathan, write lyrics. David, the drummer, come up with drum grooves. Ed Monkey, come up with guitar grooves. I even brought Dr. Dre's program in just to change up the writing philosophy of the album. You really pushed Jonathan to help him write the lyrics, right? Oh, yeah. Because sometimes you're more hands off, but sometimes you really have to push people to achieve their best. You have to know when to lay back and when to be affirmative. And again, being a producer, you know, you have to have plan A, B, C, D ready in case A fails. You know? Okay. So then tell me about Madonna. Because I, I found conflicting things about which songs you actually worked with her, what your role was. So tell me what you did. And then 
Um, yeah, just tell me what she was like. I mean, if you had direct contact, because at the time you worked with her in 85, I mean, she was huge. She was probably the biggest pop star around. Well, first of all, I worked, the first time I worked with her was on Open Your Heart. And I got a call from Michael Austin at Warner Brothers saying, you know, we got this true blue album out. We're going to put one more song out and see if it does anything. If not, we're going to go to the new album. Hmm. And it was Open Your Heart. <clears throat> so I said, hey, I'd love to, you know. So I took the song. I brought on a bunch of musicians to enhance the original production. I made the dance version about 10 minutes and almost 11 minutes long. And I said, I want this to be the ultimate DJ bathroom record where you could put it on. Your crowd wouldn't get bored and you come back into the bathroom break. <laughs> and what was interesting. I remember Michael getting back to me, he said, this version's amazing and it's not boring. <clears throat> I probably put everything under the sink into that record to make it interesting. I met Madonna earlier than that when she was dating John Benitez, Jelly Bean. I met her in a club. I mean, you know, what's great about Madonna, she's the most amazing marketer, business yes. person who knew what she wanted and she knew how to get it. But you would not want to, I, she, she kind of scares me too. Like I would not want to get into a fight with her. I would assume that would be one more where you kind of let her take the lead. <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I don't shy away from anybody. Bring it on, bitch. That's really? Yeah. Cause oh, I was, yeah. I was going to ask you that because they could have the, these stars can have these huge egos and say, I sold so dude, many millions dude. of records, but you have sold so dude, many millions I of records too. Fucking Mick Jagger. I work with the biggest artists in the world. I work with Prince. Right. The only one who ever intimidated me in the studio was Joko, and I learned from that at big time. Oh, what happened there? Well, uh, I worked on the Milk and Honey album, the album after John passed away, the right. album after Double Fantasy. And um, what was interesting about that project, I was working with a guy, Klaus Borman, who uh, did worked with the Beatles, did a lot of, uh, I think he, I believe he did the artwork for the Revolver album. Great guy, Klaus. I worked with a, a band called uh, Trio from Germany. And we built a good relationship up, and he recommended me to work with Yoko. So Yoko probably interviewed about 50 million people to work on this record, and then they called my, it was my turn. I met Yoko at the Dakota in Manhattan. We'd sit down, she interviewed me and read tarot cards. So I didn't think much of it. <laughs> what? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, she, I mean, she was into that. Hmm. And uh, I got a call a month or two later. Did she, wait, what was your tarot card reading? Was it was it good or bad? Or? I guess it was good. Okay. You know, I, didn't, I didn't ask her. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I got a call from her assistant, Sam. About a month or two later, it was probably about four or five in the morning. I just got out of work at a club. Says Yoko would like to see you. And I was living in Long Island at the time. And I had to drive in Manhattan at five o'clock in the morning. I get all the way there. And Sam says, uh, Yoko was going to hire you. That was it. No meeting or anything. Sam, I said, you couldn't tell me that over the phone? <laughs> yeah, anyway. right. So anyway, we had six John tunes and five or six Yoko tunes. And Yoko's original vision was to bring Paul Schaefer in, which is a good friend of mine. love Paul Schaefer. And bring all these musicians in to enhance what were demos. And I fought against it. I said, Yoko, I think it would be better if we just work what John did and make it sound as good as possible and not add the additional musicians. Hmm. And we went back and forth many times and she finally agreed to do that, which I thought was a good thing. You know, you know, um, the all the songs were demos. Some demos were from the double fantasy sessions. And I felt it was a, a, an honest charm to them. Let's just do what they were recorded. You know, some songs we were recorded on a ghetto blaster, like growing old with me, I think it was. And we just had to kind of re-enhance that a little hmm. bit. So her idea, she wanted to bring in total new musicians and just isolate the vocals. Well, yeah, just basically blow up the production of the songs mm -hmm. and i felt the songs were good enough not to do that so it was like you know a creative um cat it wasn't a cat fight but i really tried to sell the point at the end of the day if she she said no then we would have brought them in right okay but you won that one so you kind of went up 
Well, I think she, personally, I think she won that one for the fact is uh, everybody praise her for not bringing in additional musicians. Okay. <laughs> well, it was a win-win then. Okay. So, yeah, speaking of, uh, but besides you fighting with the musicians, I know Tesla, I had Brian Weed on, and he, I mean, that band is like famous for having fights, you know, within the band. He said there was like full-on physical fights. Did you see any of that during the no. recording and production? Not at all. I mean, again, we produced the first three albums and <clears throat> there was no tension at, at there. Um, you know, our approach was to make it almost like a live album, getting everybody playing together, rehearsing, pre-production, and getting where it feels more natural instead of high-gloss overproduction. Um Later on, they might have had fights, but I, I, I don't remember any any fights. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, I think in the later album, they felt that they could do everything themselves. I said, God bless them. <clears throat> but as far as I'm concerned, the first three albums will out out test any of the other albums they did, and there's a reason for that because we stayed on top of the songwriting. Mm. So you did you help with the songwriting then on those ones? Oh yeah. Yeah, Michael okay. and myself, yeah. Okay, wow. So then... I mean, the original lyrics of Modern Day Cowboys, the chorus was, Modern Day Cowboy is a winner. And we changed it up. It's a showdown and a modern day, you know. Oh, okay. We changed that up. Yeah, so it's just those little tweaks here and there that can really make or break a song, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I it's, think mechanical... I mean, the first time Mechanical Resonance was, was a... Um, uh, 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 I don't know. It's just everything happened amazingly. You know, uh, we worked at Bearsville, New York, and had a great room. Uh, the console we worked on was actually the Who's Quadrophenia console. It was an old Neve uh, console. Had a big room. And um, the only regret I had, Jeff always wanted me to put a lot of effects on his voice, and I fucking hated that. <laughs> I didn't like that. But, yeah. you know, Jeff was always kind of insecure and he's a great, I mean, I'll give you an honest, honest thing. I'm in the studio in New York. Jeff Beck walks into my room and I play him the first test. Where he goes, I want that singer. I said, you can't have him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's quite a compliment. Did Jeff, uh, Keith, did he know that Jeff Beck wanted him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I told him, but uh, you know, he really liked him and um, wow. I'm very proud of those albums. I mean, we spent a lot of time on them and um what I loved about early Tessa was Frank and Tommy Skeo. Tommy Skeo was the metal guy. Frank was like I called the Jimmy Page guy on guitars. But I thought the two needed to work together because I liked the idea of mixing the two styles together. Mm -hmm. Like when we did Coming At You Live, I almost kind of molded that song. that says, you know, you look at like Van Halen Eruption, that intro of the Van Halen song. Eruption. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's classic. Well, I kind of molded that to coming at you live. I said, why don't you guys do a guitar duel? And and that's how you start the coming at you live thing. So if you hear the intro, you'll you'll see where that that, that idea came from. Ah, okay, yeah. That's that, all that all those songs are so great. But I think it's interesting that you you turned down Guns N' Roses to work with Tesla, but you did end up mixing the Appetite album. Um, so talk about that. And and you also you got to hear so did you hear some of the demos at the time? Like cause they had the November rain demo on appetite sessions, right? Here's the deal with guns and roses. Tom Zutat started sending me demos when we, we were working on, I believe Tesla's first album. Absolutely fucking loved them. When I heard welcome to the jungle, even his demo for me said, this band's going to rock. And I wanted to produce this band so bad, but the problem is we worked on like six projects at once. We were fucking fried. Mm-hmm. And for me to get involved in something, you have to be a thousand percent. And I really want to do the band. I said, can you wait a little bit? He said, no, we need to do it now. Mm -hmm. So why don't you find somebody to produce and we'll mix it for you. And that is, that's how it went. And um, so we wound up mixing Appetite. I think it's a great album. I mean, obviously, I have yeah. demos and November Rain was a demo. We felt Sweet Child of Mine, one ballad on the record. November rain needed some tweaking, so I felt it wasn't quite ready for Appetite yet, which held true because Axel had 
a totally different approach to his new music than Appetite. He wanted more of a lush production. So that gave him time to express what he wanted to do with that song. And I think it came out brilliant. Yeah, because I think they, uh, you know, the goal with Appetite, you said, was to make it dangerous, high energy, in your face and dynamic. And I would say mission accomplished. I mean, that whole everything about that album is like perfect. In my opinion, I love that. That's one of the best albums ever made. Yeah, I mean, I love that album. What was really cool about that album, you know, did I think it would be the biggest rock and roll album of all time? No, but I felt this is where rock and roll need to be in that time and place. I need to have danger and everything like that. And again, I have to give a heads up to Geffen Records. They spent over a year and a half promoting this record where most labels will give you 10 minutes now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we released Welcome to the Jungle about three times. (laughs) That's right, yeah. And and when they uh, and MTV uh, uh, Geffen held MTV to the fire, saying play, play this song, and they wound up putting them on like three o'clock in the morning. Once they put that song yeah. on, it went fired up, and then when Sweet Child came came out, that was it. Right. So did I? I don't know if I heard this right. I thought I heard you talking about you hanging out with Axel in the eighties and, and having an entourage and going to playboy mansion and all this, or can you talk about well, that? Or, the, Well, here's the deal. We were very close in the eighties. We hung out in LA a lot. And I remember seeing entourage for the first time. Yeah. TV show. And, and it's not just Axel. I can relate to that show because that's where, where I did a lot of work in LA. That's how I grew up in LA working having the entourage this and that i mean i can relate to that show it was awesome you know you get to go to the playboy mansion you get to go this and that all the big parties and it was cool but you can't can you talk about is there any axel stories or do you have to sign like a non-disclosure agreement with some of these guys no but uh uh you know i will keep um i'm writing a book and i decided in my book I want to keep everything positive because there's enough interesting stories where I don't have to get into the dirt or skeletons in the closet. You know, uh, when you work with an artist, there's an unwritten law. uh, Keep your dirty laundry private. (laughs) Yeah, no, for sure. But there's got to be some pot, like some fun. That's got to be fun hanging out with those guys. Anybody in that band in the 80s. I mean, maybe a little too crazy, though, too. Maybe it's a little, like, too much fun where you're like... Well, I've always been, you know... I mean, as far as my drug use, I used to like smoking pot. You know, I wasn't a big anything else. I mean, because the thing is, I'm a control freak. And I can't do anything I'm not in control over. So that was probably my saving grace. There was an interesting thing that happened when I was about 16. Somebody gave me acid once. And it totally freaked the hell out of me. And... My friend, it was probably the best life lesson ever. And I got through that never again. And I remember working with Keith Richards. I said, Keith, I said, Keith, what do you like about heroin? And Keith goes, it's the best fucking drug you'll ever do. I said, well, that's enough for me to keep away from it. <laughs> and then um, I think it was in the 90s. Clive Davis calls me. I said, Steve, I just signed this exciting band. I want you to work with that. I said, cool, Clive, who is it? He goes to Grateful Dead. I says, no fucking way, Clive. I am the <laughs> undead of deadheads. You don't want me working on that. And he kept talking to me and talking to me. And we said, okay, we'll mix the song. I think it was a song called Fade to Gray. And we're in the studio. I'm working with Michael on the track. And Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir come walking in the studio. And Mike goes to Jerry. says, what do you think of your vocal sound? And Jerry goes, that's not me. That's Bob. <laughs> so Michael <laughs> said, well, I guess you can see what kind of deadheads we really are. <laughs> and after that, they yeah. fucking loved us. You know why? Because they never met anybody who give a flying fuck who they are, what they did. And I got we got along huh. great with them. They loved working with us. And it was a pleasure hanging out with Jerry. And Jerry told me a story which kind of freaked me out. They, there was a, a, a show on TV in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, called Playboy After Dark with Hugh Kepner. And it was a TV show showing where they were in a penthouse, the Playboy bunnies and all these artists would hang out in a couch situation. And the Grateful Dead performed one night. And what they did was they put LSD in the punch bowl. Oh, God. And I said, Jerry, if you ever did that with me, I'd fucking kill you. 
that yeah that's isn't that dangerous of course it's dangerous back in the day it probably didn't they probably didn't think twice about it oh my gosh and then um God, I can't believe how many amazing bands you've worked with. You said you, you're not a big fan of a lot of the hair bands, but Cinderella. That, I wouldn't. Would you put them in the hair band category? Because no, uh, Tom you think, Kiefer is probably one of the most underrated musicians ever. I think this guy's a fucking genius. Yeah, that's what you said. Um, and and you're not sure because I heard something about Fred Curry. Sometimes he didn't play on some of the songs, and yeah. and you're not sure why that was. There was just well, maybe, I mean, you know, you have to understand the, the day and time. I mean. I'll give you a great story. When I worked with Tesla, that they met with other producers. Everyone wanted to get rid of Troy, the drummer. Mm-hmm. You know, because you know they all these producers have this certain way how they want to record bands, and I want this to be perfect. I want to be two four whatever. And I am the last person that ever wants to break up a band because to me a band's a family. Sure. And I said, no, I don't want to get rid of Troy. He's a great drummer. Just you know, work on it. We'll, we'll work together. And, uh, you know, I said, no, we're not getting rid of Troy. And after that album, he wound up becoming the best rock drummer of the year award. So what does that tell you? Yeah, nobody knows shit. And <laughs> you know, again, uh, I was in shit bands. I, I know what the philosophy is. I've been on the road. I've done this, you know. I know what it takes. And again, you as a producer, work with what you got. You can make it work. Mm-hmm. You know, why take the easy way out and... and, and and clinicalize what a band is. That's why when I work with a band, I want them to play as a band. Because the worst thing in the world is to make a great record and they go live and they play like shit and don't even resemble the record. Yeah, because when right. I work with a band, I want to make sure they can replicate that live and hopefully take it even up a level. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I had a meeting with uh, Jimmy Page and David Coverdale. They wanted me to produce that Page Coverdale record. And um, so I'm in a meeting with Jimmy and David. Uh, we probably had some bar or something like that. And David's going, you know, how he wants to do his vocals. I mean, David just talked like 99% of the time. To <laughs> back, right. And I listened to all the shit and I'm saying, oh, are you kidding me? And again, I was the biggest Zeppelin fan in the world. OK, so after this conversation, I said, Jimmy, let me ask you a question. He goes, what, Steve? I said, when was the last time somebody produced what you did? And he shook his head, never. I said, guess what? I'm not going to be the first. The reason why I say that is I've seen Zeppelin in the 70s, God knows how many times. And 99% of the time they played live, they sucked. Yeah, I heard you say that. That's so fascinating. Well, you know, first of all, for Plant to hit those notes every night, I mean, you're asking a lot. And Jimmy, I don't know what he was on. But he was always a little out there. Mm. Bono, if he wasn't drunk, he still held a beat, but he was questionable. John Paul Jones was probably the most reliable. And, and but you know, I've seen them so many times. But when you see the Zeppelin records and what they did in the studio, and it was Jimmy, you know how much of a genius he is to mm. do what he did. That's how I looked at it. Yeah, so it's, that's an interesting take because you're right. With a rock, it might be different with a pop artist who's probably just going to play to a tape every night. But with a rock band, if you really want to play live, you've got to be able to replicate that live. And so sometimes that's harder to well, do. Well, it's important. Even though you have samples, you have all the technology to be able to machine it a little bit. But with a real rock band, you know, even when I, when I work with a rock band, I don't want to make it too clinical because I'm saying I'd rather have a singer that can sound vulnerable doesn't have to sound in key a thousand percent i want vulnerable and dynamics is this when i work with jonathan from corn i remember i said jonathan you know wrote this lyrics i don't want you coming in reading off a lyric sheet when you sing i was hard on them and they got pissed at me but i was hard on them the monkey got pissed at me i said the guitar part isn't good enough okay i get it whatever I said, Jonathan, remember the lyrics because I want you to pull your heart and soul in this because, again, these lyrics are so intense and they have to have that intensity when you sing it, okay, to be believable. We spent a lot of time on lyrics and um, I remember there was one session where Jonathan just poured his heart and soul out onto a vocal take and basically passed out after the take. Yeah. I knew it was right. That is crazy. Well, what about um, Alice Cooper? 
Now, you said that he still had the hunger and the drive and the passion in 1989 after he had had already so much success and he could have just coasted at that point, but he was still like trying to be relevant and really wanted to put a lot of effort into that record. Trash, I think it was the one you worked on, right? Yeah. Alice was absolutely amazing. I loved his drive. I mean, first of all, we, we did that album up in Bearsville and I was never a golfer be- before, but he's the one who got me to play golf. We played, we could work till the studio four in the morning we'd be up at five or six playing golf, 18 holes before we go back to the studio. And he told me some amazing stories. I remember he was telling me, yeah, I golf with Steve McQueen. We polished off a couple of cases of beer before the 18th hole. And, and he had a drinking problem, but he straightened himself out, you know, no drinking, diet Coke, whatever he did. He is very motivated. He's passionate. He, um, I I love, I love him. I mean, I, I look up to Alice because he, he knows what's going on. And to me, anybody who's relevant has to have the hunger, Mm -hmm. you know, you can have that much success. You it's like me. I might've sold almost 400 million records, but I have the hunger and it's like, I'm starting from day one. I could care less what I did in in the past. It's all about now and the future. And if I'm not capable or relevant to do what I do, I'll quit. I don't need the money. Mm -hmm. No, that's (laughs) true. That's, that's really cool. I like that analogy that, uh, but yeah, every, everyone I've talked about Alice, everyone loves Alice Cooper. He seems like one of the most, the nicest guys, which is, I love to hear those stories. And his wife is amazing. I mean, we had a great time when we worked together and Desmond Child wrote most of the song and, I just love working with them. I mean, I love to work with Nars that has the passion to actually care. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of people who just want to slide on their laurels. And Alice was never that way. Hmm. Interesting. So, in the, yeah, so in the late 80s, I think, like you said, you're kind of getting bombarded by a lot of the hair bands and, and rock bands. And you were just getting sick of it. You Again, you wanted to change. So I think, tell, explain this. Your wife was from Seattle. And you guys had actually seen Pearl Jam in a club but they right. were signed to someone else. Um, so then I you- went, I went, I went up to him. I said, dude, I want to sign you tomorrow. He said, well, I'm sorry. We just got signed, <laughs> but you got and Soundgarden, I- right? No, that was Pearl Jam. No, but th- eventually then, uh, somebody brought you Soundgarden to, to produce that. Yes. Record. Uh, Steve Roboski was an A&R guy and I worked with him on a band talk talk back in the day. And we've always had a close relationship. And uh, in the turn of the early 90s, Steve calls me up. He says, I signed this band Soundgarden. Take a listen. Tell me if you're interested. I listened to it and I said, wow, this is fucking amazing. And uh, I said, yes. So it was the Louder Than Love album. It was kind of interesting about that. Chris Cornell wrote these songs. He wanted to uh, get them to Ozzy. And I worked right. with Ozzy. And he said, would you mind giving them to Ozzy? And I said, sure, not a problem. So I played for Ozzy, and Ozzy would basically say, I've written songs like this fucking years ago. I don't want to do them. Basically, something like that. Yeah, so what happened to those songs? I was wondering, did they ever end up on a Soundgarden record? Or I, I got to see if I could find the demos. I am not sure, to be honest. Oh, you might have them. Uh, yeah, I probably do. Ooh, that that would be cool to hear what those what those are. Yeah, because anything Chris Cornell did, especially at that time, I mean, was really amazing. I mean, I, 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 to this day, I can't believe he's gone. I mean, I mean, we, we had a, we had a little uh, creative fights in the studio. I remember we did the album. And at that point, when I finished the album, I went on my honeymoon and Chris wanted to do some tweaks and I'm on my fucking honeymoon in the islands. Like stop your honeymoon and come back and do these. There's a way you well. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> so he was, he's kind of a perfectionist then. Chris is very headstrong and I love him. I mean, I, I have no problem with people being headstrong and, and, and being very specific what they want. Okay. Yeah. So it's cool that you like transition. I love how it goes from like seventies disco to R and B and pop to, you know, rock and then like a different uh, genre of rock with the sound guard and corn and then saliva, the 2001, you did every six seconds. You said that at the time the record label wanted to drop the band and they were like, yeah, we don't. And you said, and you made that album huge. Well, I said, I really, I, you know, uh, the president, um, they were ready to drop them. And I said, don't drop them. I think there's some really good stuff here. And 
I thought Bob Marlett, I believe, produced the album. I thought he did a great job. So we mixed them. And I brought uh, the president in, and they were happy and they wound up releasing it. I thought it was a great album. Yeah, that is a great album, too. And, I'm still uh, waiting for my fucking Platinum Records, bitches. What? You didn't so get a Platinum Record on that one? It's at least gold. It should be Platinum by now. How, how does that work? So if you if you produce it or mix it or do anything, you should get a Platinum or Gold Record? Absolutely. Hmm. How many of those do you have? Too many to uh, count, huh? Hold on. <laughs> oh, we got to go on a tour. Because there's got to be a 400 million records, you said, right? So that's like... Too many. That's a, That would be 400 platinum records and 800 gold records? Can you see that? Yes. Oh, wow. No, I got about four rooms filled with shit like that. Oh, my gosh. The good wallpaper. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. So you this said is, that... What's this that? Is my view. This is my view. What city are you in? Oh, wow. You got on the water. Where is this? Uh, it's undisclosed. Oh. <laughs> but I left New York. Let's put it that okay, way. Okay, fair enough. So you said you wanted to resurrect rock. Like you want to put kind of like some EDM energy into new rock music and do something different. I love this idea. I think I heard one of the songs that you did called Revolution. It was kind yeah. of like an industrial EDM kind of stuff from a band called The Snuffs. And I always thought that was like the future well, of rock. actually called Blitz Union and... and, and um you know, uh, they're from Frog, and I wrote that. I actually wrote that song, and um, I think it's a great song, you know. Um, you know, I, I thought it would compare to, like, Rammstein and stuff like that, yeah. maybe. Yeah, or I saw, like, Nine Inch Nails. Like, I remember at the time I was thinking, this is going to be the future. And then for some reason, I feel like a lot of that industrial stuff just kind of didn't take off as much as I thought it would. Well, to me, it's a strong song. It's a matter of promotion and getting into the right hands. That's all it needed. Right. So you how know, do you... Hmm? Go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Right. Finish. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, how do you put your trademark on the music? In other words, like, if Appetite Destruction is not engineered by you, how would that sound different? Like, how how noticeable is that kind of stuff to the average listener? Um, it, It's hard to say because I go for the gut. You know, uh, I, it was funny with Cinderella, Tom Keever wanted to call me Mixed by Heavy Hands, Steve Thompson, because I love loud guitars. When Tom was more into, like, you know, just making everything pristine and everything like that. And I like the adrenaline rush. I remember when we mixed Appetite, I think um, the first song we mixed, is, I think it was It's So Easy. And uh, when the guitars first kicked in, I put the guitars on 11. Or just kind of ripped your fucking head off. And I remember the first listen back session was Slash walks in. I had the the, the big monitors on 11. I don't know if there, there was a, a TV commercial like a Memrix guy sitting on a couch and his head goes back and the hair goes back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a classic. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what Slash's reaction was. Yeah, you know, I, I just feel like there needs to be a danger in rock it, to me always. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love Marilyn Manson in the late 90s i love death tones i love the heaviness that they had uh um you said you love the struts you want to work with them you said if you work with the struts they will be the biggest band in the world uh no doubt in my mind how no do we make that happen mind. then how do who are they working with that who are they picking over you i don't know i think they make i think they make the wrong fucking decision every time as far as i'm concerned really what they do wrong too poppy uh, i just i just don't i think with their talent I just don't think the songs are where they need to be. Hmm. Yeah, because I love that band. I mean, they, they definitely have some good songs, but it, I'd well, like I've to... Been, I've been a fan of this since uh, day one. I'd like to see them go into more, like, harder rock, not necessarily metal, but just, like, a little... I feel like they're kind of getting a little too poppy. Well, I mean, you see bands like Chemical Romance back in the day, and you see uh, bands like Queen, obviously. To me, he's the resurrection of Freddie Mercury. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not a bad thing, but again, I would take them into a musical journey like you wouldn't fucking believe. <laughs> that would be amazing. Is there any other bands that you want to work with or that's on your bucket list? Uh, 21 Pilots I would work with, Ghost I would work with. Um, to me, 
when I work on a project, I want them to stand out from everything that's out there. And, and I take a lot of pride and respect when I do that. I don't just go in there and say, okay, let's go to the motions. Give me the fucking check. I'm gone. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing it for the money. And, but that, believe me, I'm getting paid or I'm not doing it. <laughs> but at the same time that I want to make a statement with everything I do. I think even with Blitz Union, I thought that song made a statement. How do you, cool. yeah. How do you find new bands? Because it sounds like you're into the new music. Like you, you know of the Struts. You know Twenty One Pilots. Like I, I mean, you'd be surprised how many musicians I talk to that don't follow current trends. How do you follow these current trends in music? I never grew up. I'm still 15. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't it. want to do an 80s rock record. I've done it. Yeah. You know, I'm into the new music. I know the culture of what kids are today. That's my business. You know, that's what I do. I don't want to make a, a record for 60 year old people. I want to make a record that's relevant for today. And, you know, I'll make it where six year old people might like it. Okay. And I believe in lyrics. That's important because I write them all the fucking time. A lot of times I never got credit on records for them, which kind of pisses me off, but it is what it is. Really? Uh, How do you not get credit for that? Is it the, do you not write enough or what? Well, you know, again, as a producer back in the day, uh, you did whatever you had to do to make it great. And if that means writing lyrics, doing a read. You did it. Okay. Mm-hmm. I know better now. So it is what it is. Yeah. Because now you want this, that credit because that's, that's like a point or whatever that you get royalties from. Not about royalties. It's just getting credit for what you do. It's not about the money. What are you most proud of in your whole career? I mean, you won seven Grammys. You've worked with pretty much every big name artist. It's hard to say because I've had a lot of peaks, but since David Bowie was basically my mentor, working with David was probably my biggest highlight because um, in 1974, I, w- I was working at a, uh, a record store that had guitars, stereos, I called Sam Goodies in Long Island. And I remember the guy who worked in the guitar department Gave me this Ziggy Stardust record. He says, you know what? Listen to this record. It might take you about 50 times, but when you get it, you'll get it. When I listened, I got it. And I had the opportunity to go see David Bowie live at Radio City Music Hall doing the Ziggy Stardust show. And that absolutely blew my fucking mind. Because first of all, uh, Clockwork Orange came out. And if you listen to the music Clockwork Orange, they had a chamber organ player playing the Clockwork Orange shit before David came out. And I don't think I blinked once. I saw this show and I was mesmerized. And I watched every David Bowie show. And I wasn't gay, but I probably would have sucked his dick. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. Absolutely. What I loved about David is he's a comedian. He could do one record and totally change the whole philosophy on the next record. And I love that. No matter how yeah. successful it was, he moved on. Yeah. And I worked at Carlos Alomar many times, who was David's music director from probably about 1976 up when they had Young Americans. They had Luther Vandross, Robin Clark, everybody in the band, even Earl, I believe Earl Slick was playing too. And I developed a relationship with Carlos, which this guy's a freaking genius. And I love the work. In fact, uh, I was very honored when I got elected to the Music Hall of Fame in New York. Carlos introduced me, and that was one of my highlights of my life. And um, I can't say enough about Carlos. I mean, I mean, he was, I mean, when I first, first song I think I worked with David Bowie was called Love and the Alien. And David was in the studio, but I brought Carlos in to be David's ears. And that's mm. how our, our relationship started. And again, Work with Bluey Song, bring calls in. And, uh, you know, that's basically how that went. That's amazing. Well, you've had an amazing career. I look forward to uh, more stuff that you do, especially these movies. I'm really, and, and your book. That's going to be Appetite for Production. I love the title. I think that's going to be really <laughs> well, exciting. I have to give, I, have to give, I, I, I did, uh, the original concept I was going was uh, Welcome to My Jungle. Oh. And then I, I did a, a contest online on facebook i said if somebody comes up with a great title i will mention you and this guy tom hazard uh 
Oh came yeah, up. that's isn't that a David Elfson's friend? Right. Tom came up and says that's easy. The appetite for production, and right away I said that's perfect. So I have to give Tom kudos on that. That's, that's a perfect title. That's great. Well, I like to end each episode with a charity. Is there is there one that you like to support or give a shout out to here? Well, uh, we're always into animal charities that don't steal all the money. <laughs> <laughs> Is there I mean, is there I, one that wife, doesn't do that? Uh, everybody does that. My wife, God bless her, <laughs> um, she works with older people every day, which I love her for, and uh, we're very giving people. But you know, there's so many charities, but uh, uh, any animal charity. I mean, okay. everybody says ASAP, ASC, whatever that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. I just don't know if the money gets there. I know that stuff that worries me too. When I when some of these charities, I'm like, I don't because they're they well, don't 99% have ninety nine percent of charities are a business. That's the problem. Yeah, they have you CEOs have to... that make six figure salaries, and I'm like, isn't this sure. a charity? I don't hey, understand. Any, any douchebags? Are, okay, we're gonna make a charity here. Give me the money. Yeah, and it's sad when people you know, poor people will give money because they're, they're right. trying to help. And it's like, it's just going to some rich CEO. It's like that, churches. It's like churches. They give a tithe. And meanwhile, <sighs> all these passes are driving around in Maseratis and have $50 million mansions. Really? Ugh. Yeah, that's not good. Well, hopefully we, uh, I'll try to find like a small one or something like that. Um, but I appreciate you doing this. It's been a lot of fun and hopefully you'll come back and we could talk more about your uh, next projects. Yeah. Anybody wants to get hold of me, they can go to my website. Steve Thompson productions.com. Um, I'll put that is, in the notes. Yeah. They, they can get in touch with my manager and, uh, I'm always looking for great artists to work with. And again, I'm very, uh, critical who I work with. And, and, um, like I said, if I'm going to work with somebody, they're going to make a difference. That's all I can say. So would you, do you work on a sliding scale? Like in other words, if there's a band that maybe doesn't have a lot of money, but you think they're really good, maybe you uh, adjust your rate for them. Uh, I really, you know, as far as rates go, you know, you can't look, live on royalties, you know, it, it's got to be an upfront fee and uh, royalties afterwards. But I know there's a lot of bands that are hurting for money. I, I sympathize. But if you saw how many artists come to me every week, I just can't do it. How you many know, artists gonna, come to like, yeah, you must get a lot of people reaching out. I, I do. And God bless them all. But, you know, my time is valuable. If I'm going to get involved with somebody. They're going to have to make a major commitment because I'm not going to let them fail. So if they can't afford it, what they need to do is show you the drive and the hunger they have by coughing up the money, right? Isn't that a big, cause then they well, know they they're can, all they in. Do a, they could do a GoFundMe page or yeah. whatever, you know? Yeah. No, I like it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Steve. I appreciate it and taking the time. Not a problem. Great. Have a good one, Chuck. All right. You too. See you later. Bye. Bye. Great stories and good advice. I found that educational, entertaining, and inspiring. And that is always the goal with these episodes. So I hope you agree. And make sure to check the podcast notes for all the links that we talked about. And keep an eye out for Steve's next projects, the movie and the book. Both of those should be really fun. So thank you so much for listening. And as always, I appreciate you and your support with listening. And also the sharing and commenting on social media always helps me out a lot. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. And remember to shoot for the moon.